Okay, so today's class introduces the final section of the course on latent variable methods. So there's three classes on latent variable. I'll um, probably use the last class for a bit of a review. So really just two, two classes and maybe some more time with it if I don't quite finish up. And um, just a note here on this extra classes on the multivariate stuff. So when I do the multivariate material in this course, I'm going to go into quite a thorough coverage of one of the multivariate methods, so latent variable methods called PCA. There's an additional multivariate method called PLS, which is more for regression modeling, that I don't have time to cover in this class, and it's not part of the syllabus either. So those extra classes will go more into those other multivariate methods, as well as showing additional applications of PCA. What will also be different in those classes is that we won't use R, we'll use a more uh, point-and-click type software. And the reason for that is, is R isn't geared for the sort of data that uh, we need to look at in multivariate data analysis. With multivariate data analysis, there's a lot of excluded data point, refit your model, see how it is, uh, then iterate through that several times. And you need to use a lot of mouse work. And as you've seen with R, you, you just can't interact with it with the mouse. So we'll actually introduce a different software package for those four classes. Um, and what that means conversely is that in this class, for this course, I won't get into a new software package. I don't want to introduce a new software package just for two classes. Um, we will use R. It will be maybe a little bit uh, more command line work than you'd like, but I'll put a very detailed tutorial up on that. Uh, that's actually not too tough doing it for R. It's just when it comes to PLS and some of the other methods, we need to use different um, so just on those dates, the first one is in fact a Tuesday, it's not a Monday. Um, the classes were going to be Monday, Monday, Friday, but I've moved it to Tuesday, Monday, Monday, Friday because I believe there's a, an optimization exam on the um, So we've moved the first class to the 15th. It's in the new engineering building on the fifth floor. Okay, so in this section is going to take you to a very different way of thinking about data. Um, I, I'm actually quite excited that this is covered in the, in the, in the course at Mac. Um, previously, this was taught just for two, three hours at the end of the 4C3 class. I've maybe pushed it to more than seven hours because I feel it's so important. I'm seeing all the time um, in technical papers as well as uh, conferences in like the CSCHE conference this concept of PCA and PLS, you may have even seen it already yourselves, it's being used so widely that I really want you to come away from this course understanding what that means and what, when a colleague or someone else says, I'm using PCA, what do they mean? Um, so we'll actually take quite a good look at, at all of that. <coughs> Incidentally, this sort of material is not taught at any other Canadian university except uh, Western. And I think even at Queen's they don't teach it. Um, and also what's interesting is that this course, course C3, is kind of taught in third year and second year even in some other ways. So I feel that's also bad because really this course material is what you need just before you start working. To learn it in second year is pretty much useless. Forget it all. So I'm excited that this stuff is, is definitely um, emphasized in the fourth year course that now. And I think it's pretty unique that way. What we're going to be looking at firstly is this point up here. Is what, why do we look at data analysis, particularly from an engineering point of view? What do we as engineers want to get from our data? And I'll focus also on what I call modern day data sets, or <coughs> current day data sets. These are the sorts of data sets you'll see when you start working now. Very different from the data sets that were in, 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 around when books like, say, Box Hunter and Hunter were written. Box Hunter is an excellent classic book for the types of data we had in the 1960s, 1970s. So there's relatively few variables where you can move them relatively independently, where the assumptions of least squares hold. But I'll show in the class today that the sort of data we, we get now, many of those assumptions don't actually hold. So we need different tools to, to process those data. Um, and one of the tools that works extremely well is this concept of a latent variable method. So I'll then spend some time looking at it conceptually, geometrically, and algebraically. It's 
it's fascinating for me. I've been working in this area for about, I'd say, eight or ten years, and every year I kind of see a different way of looking at this stuff that's, that's interesting, that, or that shows a new facet of, of, the, um, of the method. So I'm only going to look at these three different ways of considering what a latent variable is. But I have to admit that if, you, if this is an area that you're interested in and you start looking at, um, it's very, um, there's so many different ways of seeing what this does. And they're kind of complementary as well. So I'm, I'm, I'll go through this step quite confusing a lot of time actually, especially on the geometric uh, focus, because looking at the mathematical details is fine and interesting. If you pick up any stats book on multivariate data analysis, you'll see theorems and proofs and corollaries and so on. I think it's not that useful, especially from an engineering perspective. So I'm going to introduce it from a geometric perspective um, more. There will be some math though. It's important to look at the math. I, I kind of also get frustrated when I see people offering courses that say multivariate statistics without equations. I think that's just crap because you've got to look at the math to understand when something goes wrong, where do I start to look at the system? And you have to have a, a good grounding in the mathematics. So we will look at the math um, a bit. And then in the next class, I'll look at principal components regression and we'll maybe look at some applications in the last class of newer applications in the, in, the, in the last five years or so um, of making variable methods. There's some pretty exciting stuff regarding batch data analysis, product development, and so on. Yeah. Okay, so enough talking on that. Let me, um, let's take a look at what engineers want from their data. So this page four of your notes, I have a few, a few notes there. Um, we'll come back to this in the next class much more. I'm just putting this out here so that you can see where we're heading. What we want to get from our data is the ability to improve our understanding of the system. So the classic example of this is when I say go to a company and I look at their data for the first time, I'm unfamiliar with the process. For you as a new engineer, you start working at your first job, you're unfamiliar with the details of the system you're looking at. So you grab some data from the data historian and companies have huge data archives where they've collected data very highly sampled on many, many tags or variables. So you can go pull that data from the system. So you run your Excel query and you get a big Excel spreadsheet of numbers. What do you do with that? You can start looking at plots, one variable at a time, or maybe scatter plots, two variables at a time, or you could even look at a scatter plot matrix, and I'll show an example of a scatter plot matrix later on. But where do you begin to understand how the variables move? For, uh, the classic example on this is for a uh, distillation column. There's 60 odd measurements on a typical distillation column. Say 40 temperatures, 5 pressures, 5 flow rates, maybe a couple of derived variables, like an energy balance on so total energy input that's been derived from a couple of the temperatures. How do you then look at those 60 variables? to see what's going on. It would be, you would expect, the temperatures on tray two and tray four not to be too different from each other. They're going to move up and down together because those temperatures are so close to each other. So that idea of redundancy in the data is, is, why, I mean, is one reason why we have so much data. We've got 50 variables, 60, 60 columns of data, but not all of it contains totally unique new information. So how do you go about looking at that data and, and saying, well, I want to understand how the system works. Which variables move up and down together? In other words, which variables are correlated with each other? And that's what we're going to show here in this class today. Is by the, by the last uh, section of this class, we'll look at a data set that's <coughs> very small in size, but we'll show the principle of how do you learn from the data. Uh, the second one, which we'll then look at from two, two, four, and five in the, in the next class after this. But the second one is on troubleshooting. Um, this again is something that you would be able to do right away once you've completed this course is the situation where something goes wrong in the process. Now, how do you start looking at this? For example, the yield drops off 
The yield is typically at 85% and has for the past three, four days trending down 80%, 78%, and so on. And it's keep heading down. People are getting anxious. Why? What's going on? What has changed on the process? That's, that's the key question. Is when there's a troubleshooting problem, it's what's the before state and what's the after state? What is what has gone different? So we'll look at it at how you can do that using the matrix methods. Because you have 60 variables, say it's a distillation column, you could go look at 60 different time series charts, plot them all up and say, well, based on that, we see that several of these temperatures start showing a drop around the time that the problem occurred. That's one way of doing it, but it blows up when, as in most processes, they're easily in the order of five, 600 variables that are instrumented, and sometimes even more. So for a small problem, for a, a tiny unit operation that's fairly localized, you're okay. But the truth is that most processes are so interconnected with heat exchanges, uh, for energy efficiency, that there's a lot of feedback and feed forward in the process that you can't say, I will just look at the data from this unit alone. You really have to take data from several units around that unit that's causing trouble. So you then easily land up with 100, 200 variables rather than just a smaller number from that single unit. So that's troubleshooting. And then the third one actually flows naturally from that because once you've identified problematic regions, we'll show how, how to visualize the data and take it back to an uh, improved operation point. Um, or another way of saying that is to optimize the process. We've seen a little bit of that actually in the previous class where we looked at the response surface methods. Remember, I worked through that example on the board where we had just two variables, concentration and substrate, uh, sorry, temperature and substrate concentration. And we were optimizing and moving along that surface to achieve some new optimum. That's one way of optimizing a process, but it's, it's kind of expensive because you're manipulating the process and you're possibly causing unusual operation that's not going to be allowable. Um, and the example we looked at was just two experiment, uh, sorry, two variables, and we had to do about 15 odd experiments in order to achieve an optimum. That is the best way to do it. That's the truth, is to go and manipulate your process and then find the optimum. But we often don't have the luxury to do that. So how can we use the existing data that we have? And why does the existing data work? Well, actually, it's, it's quite interesting. Existing data on a process works really well sometimes. The data, in other words, where there's not been a design experiment. The reason why it works well is because there's you kind of get free designed experiments when something goes wrong in your process. Someone shuts off a valve, or your feed material changes to different, different um, quality parameters. So your process shifts in response to these external disturbances. So the, you can sometimes get free experiments, experimental results. They're undesigned experiments, but they're still manipulation in your process. So what we're saying here in this third point is, how do we go back and say, can I use the past two, three years of data? Now, a lot of that data is uninteresting. A lot of it's just going to be flat lines or noise or where the process is operating constantly. But quite a bit of it is also going to be people tweaking valves and making changes on the process. So that introduces variance into our process. That variance shows up as some sort of response in a Y variable. Right? So you've got these inadvertent inputs called Xs and you're getting these responses from them, how can you use that data then to improve your process without the design experiment? The fourth point here is, um, is one that's called soft sensors or predictive modeling. Uh, we will cover this one as well. This is actually one that's very valuable, especially in areas where you've got hard to measure variables. So a classic example was the one that you looked at already in the course was the distillation column, the vapor pressure. That vapor pressure takes about eight hours to get in the lab. So someone has to go to the process, take a sample from the bottom, uh, from the bottoms of the distillation column, walk it over to the lab, eight hours later, maybe they get it to the lab when the lady's gonna go home for the day, so it's gonna wait for the 
this morning. There's time delay there. In the meantime, the process is going more slow because that, that system is not quite at where it should be. So the idea of soft sensors or inferential sensors is using the other process data that you can get pretty cheaply and very high speed. So temperatures, you can record instantaneously, pressures, flow rates, all the, all the column, all the variables on the column, those 50, 60 variables, could be used in some way to predict the vapor pressure. Um, and then you use that now for feedback control, or at least you're manipulating the process, rather than waiting for the lab vision. You always use the lab vision anyway. You'll never see a company saying, well, right, we're going to shut down our lab. We don't need it anymore. You'll still keep the lab measurement as a validation um, periodically, but you will still then use the online prediction to control your process for real-time control. And then the fifth one is, uh, we looked at the concept of process monitoring actually in, the, in one of the earlier sections, where we just looked at a single variable at a time. I'll show you that here in this uh, section five, when we get to it in the next class, is that when you've got two variables that are correlated with each other, you actually increase your type one error dramatically and can cause a lot of false alarms. So how do we account for that in a multivariate sense and monitor multiple variables over time? So that's going to be the topic there. So I hope these kind of show you where we're going in terms of um, what we as engineers want from our process data. Okay, so just to think, cover what, the, what, what I'm going to get here is, is the types of data we deal with. And as I show you these data types, I'll also point out what the, why they're problematic for us. We've learned about univariate tests, like t-tests and so on. We've learned about linear regression, where you relate two, uh, one or more x variables onto a y variable. Those tools were great. Design experiments, they were great. But they worked very well under the conditions that they were intended for. So when we go through these data sets, yeah, I'll point out why the tools we currently have been learning about are, have some deficiencies. So the first one here is just to point out, like I said here earlier, at the start of last century, when Schuart was designing his chart, and when Box Hunt and Hunter were talking about uh, design of experiments and so on, the sorts of data they had was these matrices with very few number of columns. So let's call our K, um, we'll call this number of columns, and we've got N observations. So N has always been big. Um, we've kept the process industry, N has always been a large number tower. Whatever your budget is to collect data, you can make N as big as you want. But K is often the limiting factor, especially historically. There wasn't the ability to buy or measure at line at least the spectral measurement. So nowadays, you can plug in a near-infrared probe into a pipe and get a complete near-infrared spectrum in one second, all the material flowing in that pipe. Uh, and they have that for several types of spectroscopy values. But back then, the variables selected to go into a matrix like X was things that were easily measurable, pretty cheap, and they were not able to measure them at every single location on their plot, right? So if they wanted to measure temperature on their distillation column, they would pick a key tray, say tray number five, which is where the reflux comes back in, and measure temperature at that location. Nowadays, pretty much every tray is instrumented with temperatures, and sometimes doubly so. Um, in, the, in the example that I showed with process monitoring with the VASCO, where they were using the temperature measurements to, uh, to control for the extrusion of the metal up um, there, they have over 30, 40 temperature sensors just along the, where, the, where the metal is extruded up. So there's this tremendous redundancy in today's data. Back then, they chose their variables carefully so that they didn't overlap with each other. Each variable was, was measuring something that was new or different about the, the quantity we measured. So within the row, for example, say it could be a batch of raw materials or your final product that you're shipping to your customer. When you ship your final product to your customer, you would pick the three or four key characteristics that define that product. 
Nowadays, I've worked with data sets where they measure density in three or four different ways. But they're all kind of different ways of measuring the same thing. And these density numbers are all correlated with each other. Back then, they picked the density that made the most sense and which they could work with in their budget. So as a result of that, each column was independent and probably had low error. Which meant that you could use tools like multiple linear regression, which assume that the columns of x are measured independently of each other. So that when you calculate x transpose x, you can invert it. And remember the assumption for multiple linear regression says that your x's are measured without noise. So we don't assume any error in our x's when we're doing a multiple linear regression. Um, so that meant these tools were, were valid and worked fine. Um, so again, this is the case. Let's take a look at some combinations, small n and small k. This is the case. We still see this today, but it's not that frequent. Um, it happens when you have very expensive measurements and you have low frequency on them. Then the tools like scatter plots to visualize your data and linear regression as well, because you have a small number of variables. Um, just to point out that if you're plotting scatter plots on, on a data set and you have k variables, the number of scatter plots, so a scatter plot would be you plot xi versus xj. The number of scatter plots you can form is uh, k to k minus 1 divided by 2 scatter plots. So if k is equal to 3, you can form a scatter plot between variable 1, 2, 1, 3, and variable 2, 3. So that's 3 times q minus 1 is 6 divided by 2 is 3. There's 3 scatter plots you can form. But the key point here is that this grows quadratically within rounding error that's proportional to k squared. So if you have eight variables in your data set, you have 64 scatter plots to go look at, roughly, give or take. So it, it just blows up beyond a very small number of k. So scatter plots with scatter plot matrices, which I'll look at shortly, really are just useful up to about 10 or so variables. After that, you, you have a, a combinatorial problem. Okay, so this was a, the picture you saw from the Tetum exam last time. Um, the reason why I put it back then and I asked you, if you remember in the exam, I asked you what, what, how would you deal with this data? I'm going to, we'll talk about, about that now. The situation here is what, uh, what we would call a, a short fat matrix. So your matrix X has got a few number of rows with many, many columns. So you've got many columns K and a few rows N. So in this example, we've got, uh, I think there's 400 odd measurements, and each one of these rows belongs here. So each one of these lines, that's a single spectrum, is from one row in your data set. So that's from one sample over time. And if, you're plotting, if you're measuring the spectra every five seconds, you would generate a new row in your data set every five seconds. On, on however many wavelengths you have. So in this case, I think there's 650 wavelengths. This particular case study comes from imaging tablets. So they would take a tablet and then point a near-infrared probe onto the tablet surface. It maybe scans that local region and records the spectral response, the near-infrared spectral response, so that's the absorbance piece that you get there for that tablet. So you can see that you probably have a few number of tablets, but you've got over 600, and sometimes these instruments easily measure 1,000 or 2,000 wavelengths going across this way. Okay. The, you would obviously see then, so this would be tablet 1, tablet 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on, would be the spectral response at this wavelength for all those tablets would go up and The response that you would get at wavelength 1050, for example, is not going to be very different to the response you get at the next wavelength along, say 1052. In fact, you get very little difference between this whole region over here is not showing you anything that's new. If you've got the spectral response for tablet 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, up to 400, the response 
across those tablets. So in other words, we're looking now at the data within a column. Okay. So the data at, at wavelength equal 1,100 for those n tablets is not going to look very different to the data at wavelengths 1,100 and and four. There's a tremendous amount of redundancy in the wavelength direction. And so what you often see people doing when they're faced with this sort of data is they say, well, I'll pick up the key wavelengths, the important wavelengths. I'm going to say, well, it looks like wavelength somewhere around 1,200 seems to be important. Wavelength over here seems to be important. Another one is about 1,600. This area is just noise, so they throw all that data away. And they'll maybe pick up one or two over here. So then they've reduced their number of columns from 600 odd columns down to maybe 10 columns. So that's one way that they get independence into their data sets. Remember we said that you need independent columns to of the X transpose X. Um, that's why we do it. And I make this note here that you can't use multiple linear regression um, just to expand it a little bit. Say, for example, you were using the spectral measurement to predict some sort of property of the tablet. So now you've got your data here with about k equals 600 columns. You have n, say, 40 tablets, and you have a y variable over here, which is the single y. Okay. You want to use this data to predict some sort of property of your You cannot use the whole spectrum to do that. Okay? Because this matrix is now x, x transpose x is going to be a 600 by 600 matrix. Okay? Firstly, that's a, a big matrix to invert, and secondly, it's not invertible because it's so highly correlated. Um, so when you multiply that by, so you convert that into say x transpose y, so then that's going to be 600 by 40, and 40 by 1. Okay. So you're going to get a, re you're trying to estimate a regression coefficient that's 600 by 1. You're, you're saying the vector b, the regression coefficient, is a 600 by 1 regression uh, prediction vector. That's impossible to calculate 600 parameters from 40 data points, 40 rows. Okay, we're just just not able to do that. So, multiple linear regression cannot work when k, the number of variables, is bigger than the number of rows. So that's why, when spectroscopists are faced with this problem, they'll go to the matrix X and select several columns from X. So they'll pick those four or five columns, and they'll use those key wavelengths then to make their prediction of y. Okay? So that they can then get this down to a manageable size. What we'll show in this class is that you can actually get, you don't even need to select the columns. You can just use all the data, and we'll reduce the number of columns down to a much smaller number of columns. That's what a latent variable method will do for us is they will find the important directions in this method, the important variables. And then we can go through this prediction. So by the end of this, uh, this class, or this uh, course, at least, you'll be able to then plug this matrix in and predict a certain y variable from it. So I'll, I'll, we'll get to that. I'm just showing you here where we and, and why we need these two to do Then uh, this was the case we've already looked at, where you've got large n and small k. So this is now a tall, thin matrix of this size. Um, and it's no different to the case that I said at the beginning of um, the class. Back in the 1920s, 1950s, they also had a big n and small k. But the difference back then is that k was small and n was small. Now it's just grown still in proportion, 
but the number n is still is much bigger and the number k is much bigger. So we, we now, on most chemical points, measure years and years of data sampled at once per second. So n is a huge number in millions. And k is in the order here, I'd say for a modest petroleum refinery, they would easily have 2,000 to 5,000 variables uh, being recorded in their database every second, and sometimes twice a second. That's generating on the order of about 100 megabytes per second, being archived in these historians, as they call them. So these data historians go and electronically sample the temperature probes, pressure sensors, and all sorts of other instrumentation and gather these data sets and build up a huge matrix that's uh, retrievable by you as an engineer and to go troubleshoot your process and, and uh, monitor your process and decide how to find the more optimum operating point. So you can see quickly how scanning through these megabytes of data gets to get out of hand uh, because it's now so easy for us just to arbitrarily go add temperature sensors to every tray and and add various sensors all over the plant. Another point isn't just these sensors. These are easy physical measurements that are understandable, but often uh, one thing that we do is we'll calculate dimensionless numbers or energy balances or other derived quantities from the raw data. So I've seen many plants where they'll have these, those data of the temperatures and the flow rates and so on go into basically a black box model. Some engineer 30 years ago has come up with some sophisticated black box model. Sometimes it contains partial differential equations and so on. These temperature measurements and so on become the initial conditions. They solve the PDE and then they spit out derived measurements. So then those derived measurements are available as well, sometimes at the same sampling frequency as the raw data going into the system. So you get this black box with inputs from true measurements and outputs of these derived values, which are then themselves new variables to deal with. So that, that's also what goes into this X matrix, is some number of these columns are true measurements, but a certain amount of them are called calculated variables. Okay, and then um, this is the classical data structure for the prediction problem. We've looked at this already in the course, except we've looked at the case where M the number of columns in Y, when we did these squares, we've only looked at a single Y variable. But many practical cases have the need for predicting several Ys in one go. So you can build several models, N models for each of the Y variables. Or can you get away with a single model that will predict all N of these Y values for you? So this would be your, your data that you go to your database get your X data from your distillation column, you go to your laboratory database and get previous values that they've used, uh, previous uh, data from the lab, and get the corresponding measurements that the lab made. Okay. So this is historical data. You go to last year's database and get your last year's X data, go to the lab technician and get the Y values from the lab, and you build a predictive model that relates the x variables to the y variables. Now you come to now you want to use this model online. Your historical data shows pretty good predictions. You're showing you're capable of predicting the y with reasonable accuracy. So you say, well let me let me try and use this online. What that means is that at the next time step you get a new vector coming in here in matrix X, the same data that you used, and then you use some sort of model to predict that a new vector y. Then you can use that for online control or feedback control or so on. And later on, perhaps, maybe eight to 10 hours later, this y variable comes available from the laboratory. You can verify if the prediction was good enough. Um, one, one interesting way that this is used is not just for online process control, but also for real-time release of products. So a batch manufacturer, for example, Archie and Sonia, uh, some of the companies there that deal with polar processes, they will run their batch 
And at the end of the batch, they take a sample, send it to the lab, and then they decide that sample shows the product is good enough to ship. But often that sample takes several days to, to measure. So what they want to be able to do is use the data from the batch. So I'll just call this X now, like this. But we'll, we'll look at batch data uh, a, little, a little bit later. It, you can get it down to being represented this way, even though it's not recorded that way. So, but the point is you get your batch data in X. Then you get your data from a new batch that you've just run. And you predict your Y, Y hat. And if your prediction is good enough, then you ship the product to the customer right away without waiting for the lab value. Okay? But it may not even involve the customer. Your customer might be your own company, just the next unit operation down the street. So rather than holding all this material in the batch reactor, you can now pump it out into the next downstream unit operation and free up this batch to run your next batch. So it's a great way to control the inventory because just holding the stuff in a batch ties up your inventory in the process. It reduces your ability to have a higher throughput because you're just waiting here with this material to release it to the next downstream operation. The reason why companies do that is because what if this Y value is, is bad? Well, they, they pump it to a different certain place or they reprocess it in a different way or they dump it. But if the Y is good, they've been holding it there for eight hours for what they do. So if Y is going to be good from the lab, rather just pump it downstream and, and continue processing it. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a, a strategy called real-time release. That's another, another uh, paper that's seen a lot is in pharmaceutical drugs, because they don't want to ship drugs until they know that they've been approved and have quality. But often, time to measure this why is a matter of days and sometimes weeks. So being able to make these, build these predictive models is tremendous value for us, from, from solid sensors point of view, as well as from an inventory management. Uh, the, the last, uh, one of the other data types we deal with very frequently, and this is just in the last, uh, 20 years has become very, very common now. It's these 3D data sets. Um, we'll talk a bit about batch data as being a 3D data set, but this is a, what I'm referring to here is image data. So you've got a digital camera, um, and usually these are pretty sophisticated cameras. This is not your ordinary digital, handheld digital camera. The reason for that is because your ordinary digital camera uh, takes a photo of the form like this, and you can call this the X axis and this the Y axis, and that's it. So you get your visual 2D photo. Um, proper imaging cameras will actually measure X, Y, but they'll measure it over several wavelengths. Um, so most typically, they'll measure red, green, and blue wavelengths. Okay, so they'll measure three wavelengths. Your ordinary digital camera does not shoot red, green, and blue. I can promise you. If you bought it for under thousand dollars, you are not shooting red, green, and blue. You're shooting fake red, green, and blue, which they then back calculate to red, green, and blue. But a true digital camera actually has three filters in there to measure red, green, and blue. So you now have three wavelengths, and then sometimes they'll have NIR, and maybe they'll have UV as well, or some other wavelengths in there. So they'll image food products is a, is a classic example uh, where this is used because there's no easy instrumentation for solid products. Solid products are incredibly hard to have sensors for. Food products, um, without destroying the food sample, there's pretty much no way to measure values of it. So camera systems are excellent for food manufacturing facilities because they're non-destructive and they get a lot of good information, especially here in the NIR uh, region. There's a lot of useful information in, in those spectral wavelengths. So we've got this 3D data cube, and we'll talk a bit about it in the last class. How do you, uh, the technique <coughs> say is how do you unfold this three-dimensional data to get your classical 2D data set. So we'll go from this 3D representation to a 2D representation, 
There's six different ways you can unfold that cube so you'll look at different ways of doing that. Um, this is also common in medical imaging. So when you go to an MRI machine and it's slicing visually, slices through the body, you've got X, Y, and the Z dimension, and then a time dimension often also. So with medical imaging, you can easily get up to five dimensions. If you take a video camera like to the back of this class here, at the end of the class each, each uh, week, I have 18 gigabytes of video. So there's not... 18 gigabytes of useful information. A lot of it's redundant. If you think of a, of a video, or just even a digital camera, the pixel over here in the top left corner is going to be that white spot on the wall over there. And the pixel next to it is going to also be the same white spot. And for a good region of the pix pixel area, there's going to be no new information in that, in that. So both spatially and time. So in the time dimension, that region of the, of the video is not changing. So yes, we collect 18 gigabytes to deal with, but there's far less um, real true information in that. So that's what I mean here by neighboring pixels are similar, both spatially in the x and y direction, but also in the time dimension as in sequential frames of the video. So we'll take a look at, it, at, at this concept of 3D data sets in, in class. And then, that's also a nice introduction to another 3D data set that you will see in the future, and that's batch data. So the classical case of the batch is you have your reactor, and you charge the reactor. You fill it up with several raw materials. That is then closed up. You run your recipe, and your recipe is usually run in phases. So your first phase says just mix, mix for five minutes. Your second phase is ramp temperature up slowly until it reaches 100 degrees Celsius. The third phase is hold it constant for another five minutes. The fourth phase is turn agitator on to a higher setting. And then the fifth phase is slowly add a new reagent, and so on. So you'll see these recipes multi-phase recipes with easily 10, 15 steps that go. And then once it's reached completion, the batch is discharged and sent on to the next unit operation. Or if it's your final product, you'll measure a bunch of these Ys, quality properties, at the end of the batch. So you may measure number average molecular weight, weight average molecular weight, viscosity, and so on. Various properties of interest as a result of the batch. So the Z matrix here contains what we call initial conditions. This is the name of the operator who charged the batch. Um, maybe the, the batch number of um, the, or maybe not a batch number, but call it the lot number of the raw materials charged. Uh, kilograms of A charged. Uh, kilograms of B, kilograms of C, um, and various other information that remains constant for the duration of the batch. That's the key thing. The Z matrix, each column in Z, contains information for a particular batch. So the batch is the row wise direction here. So the Z matrix contains information that's constant for that whole batch. The X matrix then contains your trajectories. So just look at one of these planes going back into the board. This first column could be the temperature. The second column going back into the board would be the trajectory against time of, say, the agitator, its power. And the third variable could be pressure in the reactor, and so on. So we've got k variables measured over time corresponding to one batch. So we've got the initial conditions for that batch, the trajectories, and then the final conditions for the batch. X, Y, and Z. That's what those mean. Now, what I've drawn here actually is a little bit idealized because the X matrix is never so perfectly broken. Each batch actually is of different duration, right? Because the recipe goes something like run phase one for five minutes. Okay, sure. Then all all the batches will have phase one for five minutes because that's the recipe. But then 
Some of the intermediate phases say things like ramp the temperature up until it reaches 100 degrees C. So if you run the batch in winter time, it's going to take a longer time to reach that set that required level than some of the batches you run in the summertime. So your winter time batches are going to have a longer plane sticking into the back of the board. They're going to extend out further there than some of the other batches. So what I've drawn here is a nice situation where all your batches kind of have the same duration, but every real batch system has this X matrix where the front is nice and even, but the back is what we call ragged. There's like different durations of batches. Um, so that's a, that's a different problem in itself. It's called the alignment problem. So how do you align these batch data first? But for now, just think it as you've got a nice 3D view of variables by time by batch. Okay. And then another type of word you'll see sometimes use is this thing called data fusion. It just means combining data sets. And that's really what we're doing here, just combining data sets. Okay, so as engineers, then the issues we face are the sheer size of the data. Okay, so we've probably been convinced now that we've got big data sets to deal with. Batch data sets generate megabytes of data. Video or image data sets generate generate uh, gigabytes of data easily within a day. That's not the problem so much is the size, but it's the road and the row dimension that we can deal with. The row dimension is easy to deal with. The problem is this column dimension that I mentioned earlier, where we've got this combinatorial um, growth in standard boxes. When I say the row dimension is easy to deal with, what I mean by that is we've got a matrix here, we've got many rows but few columns. Okay? We can deal with that by subsampling. We don't need our data every second. So then we can say, well, we'll just take an average of 60 data points, so we'll get the minute by minute averages. So then we reduce n by 160. That's an easy way to get it done. We've also got computers with parallel processors, we've got cloud computing these days, so it's easy to deal with many columns, uh, sorry, many rows. The problem is dealing with the number of columns. That's because we still have to deal with each column. We can't get rid of that. The row dimension we can easily subsample or deal with it in some way, but it's the column dimension that kills us with the modern data sets. Um, as I've mentioned there, we've got this lack of independence because column, like, so if you had to look at the distillation column data, this first column for temperature is almost identical to the next column for temperature, and so is the third and fourth column. Because you've got so much redundant sensors on your process. Now, it would be easy to say, well, I can just pick a reduced set of columns. And that's true. For the distillation case study, it would be easy to say, well, I know the temperatures of trade 5, 6, 7, and 8 are going to move together. So I'll just use the average of those temperatures. And the temperatures of trades 9 up to 20 are going to be similar. I'll also use the average of those. That's trivial. But the real uh, case, the real problem comes where you have a system with feedback control and recycling streams. Because, sure, you've got the temperature over here. Now, now we've got many calls. So K is this maybe is a bit, okay? So you've got the temperature measurements here in the first few columns. Then you've got a recycle stream or a reflux stream that comes back, and just the way that you draw your data, it comes over here as this column. And then further down, you've got another column. Then these five or six columns are correlated with each other. They're so tightly correlated with each other because these unit operations interact so much. It's easy to see, well, I know that these columns are physically close to each other. Uh, these uh, data are physically close to each other on my process. It's easy to say I will subsample them. But these columns, you may not realize that there's such type correlation, right? Because your unit operations um, have these feedback loops, you don't know necessarily ahead of time which columns to drop out or to average. So the, the reality is to say, well, or people say, just pick a reduced set of columns. And you see that in the statistical literature all the time. It's 
It's called the variable selection problem. And there's a huge number of publications on it. Every day um, in my data feed, I get two or three journal articles on variable selection. Well, yeah, you can go and select variables. But how do you select them carefully is, is really what's more of interest. And we'll show here a tool to identify when we have columns that are very correlated with each other. Okay. So we want a tool that can deal with the fact that we've got many columns and then recognizing that there's not unique information in each of those columns. How do we find the columns that are redundant? Okay, um, then this one is uh, maybe a little bit interesting. As engineers, remember in, in one of the earlier classes I drew that diagram on board and I said, we want our process to be like that, a flat line. That's what we strive for, right? We have feedback control systems that aim to keep things constant, to keep it nice and flat. So this might be the temperature, which is then in, controlled in a feedback loop to keep it constant by manipulating, say, heat input into the process. So, I'm sure that's what we strive for. The reality of COVID is there's a bit of noise and error here. But really, there isn't much information in that signal. If this process was running for several days or months, we would just have a constant flat line, basically. And that's true of most of the data we get of our process. Most of the columns are going to be uninteresting and boring. We, yes, we record 50 megabytes of data per second, but not a lot of it is, is useful because a lot of it is intentionally kept flat by feedback control and so on. So what we say is there's low signal and high noise. So the signal to noise ratio in most of our data sets is very low. Lots of noise, very little true variation going on. So what we're aiming for here is to find the signal from the noise. So how do we throw or drop this out and say that's uninteresting and find the real stuff that is interesting? Uh, so we call that happens on state. Just data that we can make of our process. Um, so then just two, three more slides and we'll have a break. Uh, this is also, when we say this, this is happens on data. When we look at this, there's no cause and effect. If I see, let's take another situation here. If I see a variable doing this, and then I've got another variable doing that. Sure, these variables are correlated with each other, but I can't say the one causes the other. So this is, um, this is heat input, and this is temperature. As an engineer, sure, I would say, yeah, the heat input is going to cause an increase in the temperature. There's, I know the cause and effect phenomenon from the first principle point of view. But when I look at, at the data set and I see this, I can only say this is correlated with each other. I can't say this, this is cause and effect. The only time you can say things are cause and effect are when you've made a design experiment with randomization. Then you can say, yes, I've made this intentional change and then I saw this, this effect. Then you can say, this is cause and effect. But the truth is, as I say here, that the correlation structure, when we say correlation, that's often good enough. Right? We, we can't expect to go do design experiments on processes all the time. So when we see this correlation pattern, we just use our heads and say, okay, well, heat and temperature are correlated. When I see this in my data set, I can infer what the, what the cause and effect is. Um, but just to, I just wanted to put it out here so that you see it there. When we see patterns in our data like this, we can't immediately say this really is cause and effect. All we can be sure of is that it's correlated with other cause and effect. Okay. Um, and one of the final issues here is regarding error. Uh, at least, as I mentioned earlier, these squares assume that your X data has no error in it. What we really do need is a metric that handles error in our data. We, we do have error in our X, so we need a metric that handles that. Um, and then a big deal is as we as we, we measure all this data, we're going to have huge chunks of missing data. 
This is a typical data set from um, the rotation process where a lot of the very, uh, several of the columns are complete, but a lot of this is missing. So for example, this is the percentage iron. For whatever reason, at this time period, maybe the lab was shut down or um, those samples were lost or the sensor went offline or was down for recalibration. Um, there's a lot of reasons why we get missing data. So when you look at a multiple linear regression, remember you create your x matrix and your y vector. So the multiple linear regressions, you've got your x matrix and your y vector. If you have a missing value in that location in x, you cannot calculate x transpose x. You just you just cannot. So what we what uh, software like R does and most other software packages is they'll drop out that complete row. They'll throw all this information away. And then calculate x transpose x on the remainder and then calculate your predictions on that. Okay? But there's ways to deal with missing data and I'll uh, hopefully just have a, um, we won't go into the algorithms for it, but I'll just at least point out that how, how it's done with many different methods. And then the alignment problem, which is spoken about already with match data. And then, so just finally, here's a summary of what we're going to be looking for from our latent variable. We're going to be looking for a tool that can extract the information from the data. So from the many columns in, in this matrix X, get find me the, the real information. So reduce, basically, all that data variable methods do is it's a data reduction tool. So how do we go from this case with many columns to getting back to that case like we had in the 1920s, 1950s, where we had fewer columns. So going from a big number of columns, so call this uh, matrix X, where we have K here, we would like to get into a new matrix called a T with a far fewer number of columns. So K is much greater than A. We would like to be able to reduce our problem down from these thousands of columns down to just a few new columns that really contain the essence of our data. So that's, that's really where we're heading with this today. Um, we want the tool to also handle missing data, these large data sets, 3D and 4D. We want to be able to use the tool on things like batch data, where we've got a Z matrix, an X matrix, and then some of the other data that I'm seeing a lot these days is like the food data sets, you've got uh, raw material properties, then you've got multiple blocks of data. How do you pull all these blocks together? Handling the idea that columns are very highly correlated, this collinearity issue, and how do we handle error? So, so let's take a, a 15 minute break or so, and then we'll walk through the conceptual idea of the data. But just to introduce it, one conceptual example of the data variable is that of your health. So when you talk about your health, there's no real measurement that you have for it. You, there's no sensors. You can just take some sort of value from your body and, 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 and rate yourself on a health scale from 0 to 100, for example. So, but we know that there, that exists, right? You know when you're feeling healthy, when you're feeling unhealthy, that you can kind of self-judge what, what you feel like, right? So it is definitely a, a progressive scale related to your health. If you wanted to quantify it, though, in some way, you might be tempted to take these measurements, like blood pressure, cholesterol, weight, uh, you may measure the waist to hip ratio, your blood sugar level, temperature, all of these add up or contribute in a, by some small amount, they all contribute in some way to defining what your health is. 
Okay, so and if you show that that data to a trained doctor, those individual measurements of blood, blood pressure, cholesterol, and so on, he or she may be able to take a look at that and mentally say, well, this looks like a healthy person or an unhealthy person. Whether they know that or not, they're kind of assessing you based on those raw data and then come up with some overall score in their head on what type of uh, level of health you have. So what we can say in this case is that health is a latent variable. So when you hear the word latent variable, it's just another synonym for hidden. It's a hidden variable. There's no way to measure it directly. Uh, but it is there, and these things are all correlated with health. So a lower blood, uh, or uh, the right amount of blood pressure would be correlated with health. Say you had a health scale, where zero is very unhealthy, and 100 is, is the top of top health. Cholesterol would be correlated with health. A low value of cholesterol would be correlated with a high value of health. Well, low, a high cholesterol level would be correlated with a low health score. So these latent variables exist in the system. The raw data that we measure are correlated with the latent variables. And the raw data all contribute in some way to the latent variables. So these words that I'm using, correlation, contribution, latent, I'm introducing them here specifically because we're going to see them over and over again in the next section. Um, another example of a latent variable could be if I took this room and I had four temperature sensors in each corner. So that, that data shown over there is an example of what one might measure in Kelvin for this room over, over a period of time. Or well, maybe not this room, but the room in general. You would expect to see some sort of fluctuation there. What might that be due to? Well, it gets cold in the thermostat, kicks on and warm it up, and then it cools down. Okay, good. Yeah, or well, um, there could be sunlight coming into the room if the room is open to the, has windows and so on. Or, or like you said, it could be some other air conditioner or a furnace that's manipulating the temperature in some way. That's not really, uh, we don't know that. Let's put it that way. We don't know what the driving force always is. What we measure, though, is a reflection of that driving force. We're measuring whatever the effect is that's causing this temperature fluctuation. So if it is the sunlight coming in, we're measuring that up and down cycle due to the sunlight. Or if it was a, a, a room controlled by a thermostat and a furnace, we would hopefully expect relatively flat lines because that's the job of the furnace is to keep it relatively flat if it's, if it's working well. So again, here in this example, similar to the health example, we're measuring variables that we can easily measure, temperature, and they're correlated to whatever the driving force is in the system. We don't know what the driving force is, we don't, uh, or we may have a guess, but if we just collect this data without doing a design experiment, without manipulating the driving force, all we can say is that we know that this data is going to be correlated with that driving force. Data is just a reflection of whatever's moving the, the process up and down. Um, now, if you, one way to visualize this geometrically might be, as I've shown here, you can go look at one variable at a time. You can show the time series plot. So, like I said in the previous part of the course, when k is very large, you've got a new time series plot for every measurement. So, like in the distillation column, there would be 60 or 70 of these time series plots to go look at. Which makes it tremendously difficult if your boss says, well, what's gone wrong in the process? You have to go through and scan each one of these, and maybe you discover, okay, yeah, there was this unusual dip in the temperature at roughly the same time that the problems occur. And then you could use your engineering judgment to say, well, that is a likely cause for the problem. But to see this is easy enough in four charts. It's very difficult when you've got 60 or 70 of them stacked together. But the main point here is what we're seeing in our raw data 
our role measurements, but it's just a reflection of the driving force. So we're, another way to look at it is to look at Q plots. Um, here I call X1 as the first row in that previous plot, X2 and X3. But we lose the time information now. So in this one, we can see the progression over time. When we look at it this way, this point over here is measuring the value of temperature at, in, for the first variable, the value of temperature for the second variable, and then the third variable in the vertical direction. So this point over here had a, 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 almost lo, uh, whatever the, the lowest value of X3 is, the third temperature, had the low value of temperature for that variable, the moderate value of X1, and a high value for X2 for the second time series plot. So just going back to the time series plot, this would be X1, X2, and X3. I'm now just taking those data points and plotting them in this form here, which we will see a lot for the rest of this class today, which we'll call these cloud swarms. So this data swarm or swarm of points shows that X, Y, and Z intersect so Z, X, Y, and Z points where that, uh, where that each data point meets and we'll, we'll call this cloud swarm. And what's interesting is that when you look at the cloud swarm this way, you see the correlation as well. And we saw the correlation over here with time. So these variables move up and down in time order. If we plot them in a cloud swarm, we see that same correlation pattern. There's almost a diagonal train in, in the box from one corner to the other, so from low to high. So this, this diagonal trend over here shows when x1 is low, so this is the low level of x1, the high level of x1. When x1 is low, we're in that region, and x2 is low, so x1 and x2 move together, they move from the top corner there down to the bottom corner there, they move along that, that zone almost. Um, looking at the middle part over here, you see the same effect, except now this is the high value of x1, this is the low value of x1 because it's, locked, it's been rotated, You're looking at it from the, the back corner. So a high value of x1 and this is a high value of x2 as well. So you're seeing the same data moving along that corner this way. But the reason why I showed this angle is to highlight there's a few unusual data points over there. If those data points were not there, then that, then that cloud of points would really, you could almost build a model of the system and say, the diagonal line from the one corner to the other corner of the box is really what we're expecting the behavior in the system to be along that diagonal. So we're going to see this a lot. I'll just another way to look at it is just to visually rotate the thing. Um, so, so you can see that same data swarm, and you can see there how the three variables kind of go move up and down together with each other. I apologize for like the zooming in and out, kind of makes me nauseous watching it. But the main point is that this diagonal line exists in the system. And notice that when it's almost at that angle, I'll try to stop it this time. There, kind of that point. Notice that there's almost like a plane. You can draw a plane through the box this way. That is the plane on which most of the data seems to lie. Okay. Here, when you're looking at it this way, you're kind of looking at the plane now face on. And the plane, and the plane is moving in this direction here. So it's just a view onto the data in a particular, in a particular way. Okay. So, so that is, when we're talking about latent variables, in this case of the temperature, what would you expect to be um, a way that you can quantify the latent variable? If I had to, um, let me put it to you this way, if I had to put two new sensors in the room, um, put one, say, in the, in the middle, 
in the left and one in the middle of the right on the right hand side, I now have six sensors in the room. But I know that I'm not getting six independent pieces of information, right? Even though I've got six temperature measurements in the room, there's still only what whatever the phenomenon is that's causing those temperature measurements to move up and down, that phenomenon is still there. Whether I put six temperatures uh, sensors in the room or eight or ten, I'm not really getting a new piece of information with each with each variable I'm adding. Okay? So if you wanted to summarize this data in, in some way, how would you do it? Any suggestions? Right, instead of looking at, at four temperature measurements or six or eight measurements, how would you do it? Any, how, how would you summarize this data? Or come to the distillation column example, where you've got measurements on the trays. Any, any suggestions on how you would reduce the number of temperature measurements that you'd have to deal with? Yeah, so if we take a look at it this way, I'll call it x1 is the first temperature, and x2 is the second temperature, x3, and x4 is the fourth temperature. We want to create an, a, an average temperature variable from that. So what do we do when we do an average? Uh, uh, so we, we take in sums here, and we divide by 4. Right, so one way to write this is, is we can say we'll take a quarter of x1 plus a quarter of x2 okay so that would be one way of, of, of writing that and I'll call this new variable some sort of average temperature okay and if, I, if I'm going to do this a bit more mathematically, I would be inclined to write something like um, x1, x2, x3, x4, and write one quarter. Okay. That would be an equivalent way of writing the same thing. Now, if I call this uh, vector, we'll call that vector x, we'll call this vector here of weights, we'll call this p. So, um, symbolically, I've got x1, x2, x3, and x4. And I would call these weights p1, um, I'm going to call these weights P's. I'm, I'm putting a second subscript here because uh, you'll see in a minute why. That's the first column of them. So it's P1 says the weight in the first row, first column, the weight in the second row, first column, the weight in the third row, first column, the weight in the fourth row. So when we write this notation, we can also say X transpose P. Saying. The terminology that we use, you will recall from the math class, is we say that the t, the average t over here, is a linear combination. It's a linear combination of the x's. So maybe this is a bad word to bring up from that math class long ago. You may have remembered that we call talking about linear combinations. The correct way to say this is that t the average temperature is a linear combination of my raw data given by the weights or the numbers in vector p. So I'll repeat that again. So the average temperature is a linear combination of the x's given by the p's. Would be an equivalent way of saying it. Um, 
this average temperature then computed from the raw data. Huh? So x transpose p. So our latent variable in the system, we don't know what the latent variable is, but we've got these four raw measurements, these x's, and we know that if we take some sort of linear combination of them, in this case the straight average of the raw data, we will get a new variable, t1. And this raw variable is going to follow, in this particular example, it will follow the exact same pattern as the x, x variable. So if I had to sketch out the T1 variable of the time, so if I had to plot T1 against time, it would probably have the same pattern as the X's as well because of the way it's been computed. So it would do this also. And then X, the X, I'll just plot here X1 would have a similar pattern. So our x's are also going to be correlated with this new latent variable, t1. I'll call this t1, our latent variable. OK, so that's, that's one way of, of thinking about a latent variable, like the health example. So coming back to the health example, you could say your health going to be some function of the blood pressure, so you may say some factor times the blood pressure, okay, plus some <coughs> weight of your cholesterol, plus some of your body's mass, and so on. You could identify coefficients as well as certain easy to measure variables that when you take a linear combination of them, you get a new variable, health. So your health is going to be correlated to your blood pressure, correlated to your cholesterol, your weight, and uh, we will just take, take your weight to hip ratio. Uh, sorry, what is the For example, so take four easy to measure variables and generate a composite index of health. So we've already said that cholesterol is going to have some negative coefficient here because when you've got high cholesterol, you're going to have low health. Okay, so we know that that's correlated there. So we know that this is going to be a negative number that's going to go in this position. We don't know what it is, but uh, those weights could be determined. I'll just introduce another example here and then we'll start to look at a bit more of the details. So the next example is one that I spoke about uh, far back in the course was this <coughs> one. We've got pieces of wood, wooden boards. And on each board, we're measuring the thickness at six locations. So we're measuring the thickness at this location, this location. So when I say thickness, we're measuring <coughs> so that width of the board over here. So we've got these six locations on the board. And in the notes, I have a picture there. I show that the average of those two thicknesses will fall tail thickness, and then this would be the thickness. Okay, so we've got those, this variable, yeah, I'll call this variable x1, would be the tail thickness, the average thickness at the, the tail end of the board. This is the feed end of the board, the side that goes into the machine first. So you've got the thickness at this location, this location, the average of that is x2. And then you can generate or calculate a third variable called taper, which is the difference between the, the, 
the one side and the other side's average thickness. So if I look, to look at this board from a, a cross section, the board <coughs> from this angle over here would have one side thinner than the other, and so taper would be the measure of this difference in thickness. So, Okay, so that could be, that's a, our system under investigation. We've got these three variables, the tail thickness, the feed thickness, as well as the taper. And if we, I mean, these are pieces of wood, they are cut by blades. So what happens is we've got the, the circular blades here and several of them. And the piece of wood kind of comes into this and gets cut through the board. So if you have that as a mental picture of the, the system, you would expect perhaps then that the feed thickness would be plotted against the tail thickness, they're going to be correlated with each other. Okay? Because as the board goes into the saws, the saws are if this is the spacing between the saws, this, the board kind of gets cut through this. The whole board is going to be cut roughly at the same thickness. So whether you're measuring the thickness on the tail end or at the feed end, your variable x1 and x2 are going to be correlated with each other. Okay? So if x1 is thicker, x2 is also going to be thicker. If we plot x1 versus x2, like, I think this, this picture is in the nose. Uh, maybe you expect that sort of relationship between the two. So this is on page 10 of the notes, you see that. Okay. But would you expect x1 uh, to be correlated to x2? Would you expect any relationship between the, the tail thickness versus the taper of the board? Probably not. Uh, nor would you expect, so these would be uncorrelated. X2 versus X3 would also be uncorrelated. Okay? So, if I had to look at the system and say, look at my variables and say, how could I reduce these variables in some way? I could say, well, x1 and x2 are measuring really the same phenomenon, the average thickness of the board. x3 is measuring something that's totally unrelated to x1 and x2. It's measuring something totally different about my board. It's still an important property. It's just whatever x3 is measuring is not captured by x1 and x2. So if I wanted to introduce two new variables that summarize the three variables, I could say something along the lines of T1, my first variable, is going to be some number times X1 plus some number times X2 plus a certain weight times X3. And, and the other phenomenon, well firstly let's finish up this one. What would you choose here for the weight for X1? if you wanted to create a new variable, T1, that summarized the thickness of the board. So in this situation, what we're, like the temperature example, we want to create a new variable that's a summary of the other, of the raw data. You could use, for example, that this is 0.5 times the tail thickness and then a half times the feed thickness and then give zero weights to the taper because it's measuring something that's totally unrelated to, to the so T1 then could be considered the average thickness of your board. T2 then would be a measure of the other independent phenomena in the system. So uh, X1, X2, so reasonable weights for this other variable in the system, we could say, well, we put zero weight on 
the tail thickness and zero weight and the feet thickness and give full weight to the taper. So now, by doing this, what I've gone and done is I've taken my raw data, x1, and 2, and x3, so I've got three variables, I've reduced these three variables down to a two-dimensional system, two new variables called t1 and t2, and I've done that by making, taking a linear combination of the raw data. So if I had to uh, draw uh, this in matrix form, I could say t1 and t2 is equal to x1, x2, x3, okay, times some matrix over here that would take me, that would just summarize this. So this would be 0.5 times x1 plus 0.5 times x2 plus 0 times x3. And the second variable would have zero common zero contribution from the first raw data point, zero from the second data point, and a full contribution from the third data point. So that might be one way to summarize the data from the third system. So what this does is we can then in the future bring in the x1, x2, and x3 data points from a new board multiplied by this matrix and it would create two new summary variables that capture all the information on the board. So we haven't lost anything. We've gone from three variables down to two variables, but we haven't lost anything. T1 measures the average thickness, the tail thickness and the feet thickness. And T2, this new variable, measures the tapering affecting the board. So we don't lose anything by doing this. But we gain the ability that we've gone from three dimensions down to two dimensions. So is this principle of reducing the number of columns? So we've gone from an X matrix which had however many boards, so N boards, and we had X1, X2, and X3. We've gone from that setup down to a smaller matrix. So this is X, we call this T. This is T1 and T2. So those two new columns summarize the three original columns. That's the principle of the latent variable model, is going from a high number of columns down to a much, much smaller number. Remember, that was, uh, in the first part of this class today, I mentioned was the big killer. In fact, this, this large number K that we have, the number of columns is really what limits us. If we can reduce that down to a fewer number of columns, we'll call this capital A. If we can get from K columns down to a much, much smaller number A, we're in a better position now because we can then plot scatter plots of these T's, we can plot time series plots of these T's. They still capture all the essential information from X in the T. But we're now down to just this more manageable number. So there's obviously lots of questions here, but how do you know how do you come up with this matrix? Like how do you come up with the best way to capture all the information on the system? Uh, how do you know what A should be? Should you have two columns, three columns? Like these are all, I guess, questions that you're asking yourselves now because you, you can probably see the value of this. Being able to go from <coughs> K equals, in most, real, in most data sets, K could be 50 to thousands of variables down to A, which is equal to 2, or 3, or 4, but still capture all the essential information. That's, that's clearly very, very valuable. Um, but the, what is the mechanics of doing going from, from K to A? And how do we know what we're losing? Okay, so that's, that's, that's what this next part is all about, is, is discussing that. Okay, so let me look at uh, look at this concept geometrically, and then uh, we'll take a look at a bit of the math. So this is on page twelve now. 
said, well, just talk a bit about uh, this visualization of what PCA is. And then we'll look at the map. And it's all for the so we're going from this, uh, so this is on page 12. I don't think I drew in the T matrix for you. You can draw it in there on the notes. Page 12, we're looking at going from this, what we call a k-dimensional world. So we're in a k-dimensional real world coordinate system where these variables k are relatively easy to measure. We can interpret them down to an a-dimensional world with smaller number. So PCA is only related to a single matrix, X, where we'll use this notation as usual, where N is the number of observations, K is the number of variables, and you can ask yourself, well, what goes in the rows, what goes in the columns. In general, that's very process specific. You'll, you'll, you'll have a better handle on that when this is your own data. But the general guidance is to put, at least initially, everything that you can measure on each object. So in each row, we have one object. This could be, for example, all the data that you can measure on your chemical process at the time point. So at five minutes past 12, you put one complete row of data here that captures the state of the process at that time. Then the next row would be, say, six minutes past 12 would be how those states have changed. And we put those data there. So that, Often our n measures time in some way, it's down with time dimension. But it doesn't have to be. Um, this could be uh, lots of raw materials. So the first batch of raw materials you receive from your supplier, then maybe the tenth batch, and then back down to batch number five, batch six. They could be in random order here. It doesn't really matter for the order in the x in that direction. And then along the columns would be the properties you measure on that observation or on that object. Okay, so when we look at this visually then, here's on the left is the, the case where we have two measurements, so two columns. You can plot column one versus column two on the y-axis. And for at the intersection of each um, point, you just plot a dot. So it's a standard scatter plot. <coughs> and you can already start to see that there's some sort of correlation between them. We're not trying, no, there's just one thing I want to point out here. We're not trying to predict this variable on the y-axis from the variable on the x-axis. I'm just showing you here two columns from the matrix X. We're not predicting one column from the other column. We're just showing that there's a correlation between these two columns by showing the data this way. We're not trying to say, can we predict the one from the other? Um, so when we show the data this way, we can estimate then, well, there's definitely a relationship there. We, we might be able to fit some sort of model to this data. If we look at the three variables now, we've already seen the rotating uh, cube that earlier on, there's also a relationship here between the three variables. It also kind of seems to go in a straight line from the bottom corner up here to the far back corner. The data sort of seems to move along a line or a plane. So I will show you now in a, in, um, in a sequence of slides here what PCA is doing geometrically. So this isn't the truth for any particular data set. This is just a general data set where there happen to be three measurements, x1, x2, and x3. So our x matrix has got three columns, and I think there's, there's say, 20, 25 odd rows here. So we've got three columns in x, x1, x2, and x3. And each data point represents the intersection of the x1, x2, x3 values here. So the first step in PCA is to find the center point of this data class. So what we do is we identify here. So I've marked, notice this point wasn't in the original. Um, this isn't an actual data point over here. This is a calculated point. So that purple point is calculated. We just compute the average of column x1 
the average of column X2 and the average of column X3. So we get a new data point here, X1. So compute the average from each column, and that will be, we can plot that onto the existing data. So it will be a new fictitious data point. What we then do is we subtract this value, x1 average, from all the values in the first column. So this process is called mean centering. We've seen this already. We saw this in design experiments where we subtract our center point. We show this in multiple linear regression. If we mean center, it doesn't change in multiple linear regression. So we're going to do that again here. What mean centering does is this says, take that purple point and subtract its value from all the others. Geometrically, that corresponds to just shifting the whole beta cloud to the origin. That's all it does. Is it's just a, a linear shift of all the raw data to a new point. So that the mean is in the center of the, of the, of the system. Okay? And then we also apply a scaling step. The scaling step just says, well, I could have measured, uh, let's say, X3, I could have measured that in kilograms. So the numbers range between 0 and 2 if I'm measuring a fairly light object. But what if I arbitrarily measure this in grams? Okay? Now the numbers range between 0 and 2,000. So that axis is going to be hugely spread out because it's artificially multiplied by 1,000. So scaling just removes that phenomenon. I'll talk about it a bit again later on. All that you just have to realize here for this geometric case is that centering and scaling your data is just reshifting your point of view to the origin, but it doesn't change anything about your data. If two, two points were close together previously, over here, those two points were over here, after centering and scaling, they will still be close together. So it, centering and scaling maintains the relationships between the data. It does absolutely nothing to distort that. It's just a necessary step that we have to do. Okay, now the first principal component step is taken to be the line that best fits through all that data. So, Imagine x1, x2, and x3 were very tightly correlated to, with each other. If I plotted a scatter plot of x1, x2, and x3, I, let's just take x1 versus x2. If two data points are very tightly correlated, or two variables, are, x1 and x2, are very highly correlated with each other, they'll almost fall on this line here. All the data points will fall pretty close onto that line. And if I introduce a third variable, so now I'm plotting x1 versus x3, and similarly, if they were highly correlated, all the data for those would fall on the same line. I'm just showing this in three dimensions. <coughs> all we're doing is we're finding the line in k dimensions. In this case, k happens to be three, x1, x2, x3. We're finding the line that best fits through all the data Another way you can see that is find the line that passes through the origin or through the mean so that the residual distance from the data point to the line, so if I say compute the residual distance from each data point to that line that I've, I've constructed, that the sum of squares of those residuals is, is minimized. Okay? That would be an, an equivalent way of saying the same thing. Is all I'm doing here is I'm finding the line that best approximates all the data. That's all a latent variable is, is the line of best approximation through the data. Okay, so when I another when I say that we're finding the best fit line, and it's a line that minimizes the error, there's an alternative way of understanding it. The best fit line is also the line that explains the maximum variance, or that has the highest variance. So let me just talk a bit about what that means when I say explains the highest variance. To calculate what variance is explaining, all that it's doing 
Once I've, once I've calculated this, I've, I've found this direction. Basically, this orange line is a vector that points to a particular direction. I found that direction now. I go and for each data point, so this is this observation over here, I project a 90 degree line to the best fit line. So construct your 90 degree line to that. Then this point lands up on the orange line, this first component. Now, this particular observation has that point on the orange line. This distance from where that point is on the orange line to the origin, okay? that distance, that's called a score. For this data point, we can calculate its score value. Its score value is the distance where that point meets the line to the origin of the, of the coordinate system. So for each data point now, for each observation, I can project it onto the line and calculate its score value. So this point will have a score value. I'll just say it will be some negative number. So going from the origin down, it will be, say, minus 4. This point to project it to the line will have a score value, say, minus 5. This point will have a score value of, say, minus 7. Okay? This point up here will have a score value of, say, plus 4. Okay? So for each observation in the system, once I've found this line, I compute a score value. So I could write it that I can get T1, 1, T2, 1. So this says calculate for the second observation the score value along this first component. That's what this second one is. So the, the first subscript refers to the observation number. So T3 is for my third observation. I can calculate its score value. The fourth observation, T4. I can calculate its score value. And remember there's n observations in the system, so I can go all the way up to Tn and calculate that its score value. Okay, so for, for n, n observations, I can calculate n scores. Okay. Is it, uh, I just want to pause here, is this clear up to now? Is any uncertainty? So what we're doing is we're fitting a, a line and don't worry, I guess you're asking yourself, how do you know where that line goes and all that? Well, there's, there's algorithms to compute that, and, and we'll talk a bit about that in, in the next class. But for now, just accept that this line can be found. Once that line is found, we, we keep it fixed. It's locked now. Then we find where each observation projects onto the line. So we project <coughs> this point onto the line at 90 degrees project this point onto the line at 90 degrees. So this projection step gives us a score value. The score value is then this distance from the origin to where that point is projected on the line. And we collect all these those point, those uh, values up and call them scores. Yeah. Sorry, are the scores and the components a vector, or is it? Okay, good, good point. Let's talk about that for a minute. Um, this orange line is, is a vector. Okay, so it, it starts at the origin, and it points in this direction over here. And it's a vector in k-dimensional space. We're in three-dimensional space here, but k is equal to three for this example. The scores on, uh, sorry, each data point is also a vector. I can draw a vector from the origin out to each data point. Okay, I'll talk about about that in, in, in a little bit later on this afternoon. But yeah, you can consider those two vectors as well. The scores on the other hand are not a vector. The scores are just a scalar. It's got a sign to indicate whether it lands on the positive side of this component or on the negative side. We, we keep the sign information, but it is a distance. But with, a, with keeping the sign. So this one will have a negative score value and this point over here would have a positive score value. As with all these other, other points, project onto this first component and keep a positive score value. 
So is the, the magnitude then, is that the distance from the point to the line or from the point, the projected point on the line to the origin? The score value is the distance from the projected point on the line to the origin, or from the origin to the projected point on the line, either way. It's probably better to think of it as the distance from here to here, because then you keep the sign. Okay, so well, it, it, it wouldn't matter too much as long as you're consistent in calculating all these things. So, what, but then there's another interesting point here is that once we get all the scores, we collect them all together, and we now have a new vector called T. So this is a vector with n, n observations in it. So it's an n by one vector. Okay, but uh, we don't need to concern with that just yet. Okay, so that's, that's the first component. When we say we've calculated one principal component, the first principal component consists of two things. The principal component is this vector that indicates the direction of the orange line. So principal component consists of two parts. The first part is this direction vector. And the second part of the principal component is this collection of score values, T1, T2, T3, up to Tn. So there's, there's two pieces to a component. A component isn't one or the other, it's both things together. A component is that direction vector that defines the line of best fit, and the component also consists of these score values, one, one score value per observation. So there's two pieces to a component. Now, we've completed the first component, so it's locked and that's fixed. Okay. The second component is fit in the same way. In the same way we, we calculate the first component to best fit the data, we calculate the second component. But there's an interesting additional constraint. We constrain the second component to be orthogonal or 90 degrees to the first component. So if you think about it this way, that the first component is now locked, it's passing through the origin. We can't shift the first component. Once, it's, once we found it, it's the best fit to all the data. So it's locked in that direction. So geometrically, when we're dealing in three dimensions, the second component must pass at 90 degrees through the first component. But I'm free to rotate it anywhere around as long as it's 90 degrees to this first component. I can rotate the second component. I keep rotating it until I find the next highest direction of variance, or the next best direction of fit. So let me explain that a bit, because it's a little bit uh, uh, confusing maybe at first. Coming back to the first component, when I said the first component is the line of best fit, it's also the line that explains the greatest amount of variance. Okay. And what I mean by that is, if I take these t values, I can calculate the variance of this vector. So there's n values in this vector. I can calculate the variance like I do on any vector. So I take the t's, I compute the sum of the t's, so that's my average t, and then I can take the sum of the squares around t average. So I can say, Ti minus T bar, so Ti comma 1, minus the average T1, and I can take the sum of the squares, and I can divide through by n, or n minus 1, it doesn't matter, I'll just stick to n. So that's the standard definition for the variance. So you take each of these scores that are computed, and calculate the variance. Okay. So it's just calculating the ordinary variance of the vector. When I say that score, uh, sorry, this component explains the greatest degree of variance in the data set. It means that this variance computed in this way is the maximum possible that it can have. So thinking back to this situation here, where you've just got this arbitrary cloud of points, you can pose this as an optimization problem. 
you want to see it that way. That's why I say you can look at PCA from so many different angles. You can look at it geometrically, algebraically. If you want to look at it from an optimization point of view, it says take this data and find the line, find the, the vector of any line that will pass through all through this cloud of points in such that this variance is maximized. That's another way to see it. Okay? It is the exact same thing as saying find the line that passes through the points so that the residual distance is minimized. The two are equivalent. You can show that mathematically. Um, or you can just see it from an intuitive point of view that if that line fits the data really well, so the residuals are small, it will spread those points out along the line as well, maximally, and have maximum variance. Um, so you can see it in two ways. But when I say this line passes through the data and has maximum variance, I'm referring to the variance of the scores is maximum. There's no, if I had to shift this line a little bit up or down, the variance of this quantity would, would decrease. This line is the line that is of greatest variance. Okay? So when I say in this second component, we're now finding a second component that is perpendicular to the first component. We're also, that's, that's the constraint. What, what we're optimizing is that the projections onto the second component, those scores now have the next greatest amount of variance. Or the greatest amount of variance possible. So let's take a look at what that means. If I, I let's say I found that direction, this to be my second component, I now take each observation and I project it 90 degrees onto the second component, I calculate score values for the second component. So now I calculate, uh, let me just add it on here. Well, I'll try it on this side rather. We can now calculate T1 for the first observation, the second for the second component. I can calculate T2, 2, T3. So for my third observation, so say for example this is the third observation, the data says T2, uh, T3, comma 2 says it's this distance from the origin to the point on the second component. So T3, comma 2, T4, all the way up to Tn, comma 2. So I get a second vector, one for each observation, that gives me the score values for the distance from the origin to the projection onto the second component. And the variance now of this would be uh, T, I comma so T I comma two minus the average value of T two and I'll take the sum of squares and I'll divide that by n. So this variance is maximized. Yeah. Um question. So like because your first component is actually in a three D space. So basically you have alternate number of second components that are perpendicular to it. So how do you define that? Okay, so the first component is a line in 3D space. Okay? The second component has to be orthogonal to the first component. So you can see that the second component could be any vector that points in a circle, in a plane, in this direction. So I keep rotating this vector around and around, and every for every rotation I calculate this variance over here. And I stop moving this vector when I find a direction that gives me the maximum value of that variance. So it's constrained to be perpendicular to that first component. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So we've gone now from three, we've got a, we had a three-dimensional system, x1, x2, and x3. So if we looked at the raw data for this problem, we had a matrix X with X1, X2, and X3. And for each 
row in this matrix X, we have calculated a new variable, T1 and T2. that is really the projection of that data point onto the T1 line, and we project this over onto the T2 line. So each data point, we find its T1 and T2 value. Okay? So that, that, that's what principal components are doing from a geometric perspective. Okay, so I'll um, then just finish off this section here by showing that these two components jointly define a plane. So the first component is a vector that just points in that direction. The second <coughs> component is a vector that points orthogonal to it. Jointly, these two vectors define a plane that's oriented in this three-dimensional space. Okay? And we can call that a plane because if, uh, from, from geometry, or from linear algebra, you'll recall that the, the definition of a plane requires two independent vectors. So two orthogonal vectors or two vectors which are linearly independent will define a plane for you. So we have that. We've got the first component pointing this way, and the second component, because by design it's been forced to be orthogonal to the first component, it is orthogonal or linearly independent, would be another way to say that those two components jointly map out a plane. Now, when we project data points, these data points don't lie on the plane. Right? Some of them lie above, some of them lie below the plane. But when we, when we calculate this projection, this projected value, and we, we, so we take this data point here up to, to uh, the first component, and then this distance out here, represents where this point would have been projected onto the plane. Okay? If I take this data point and I bring it down perpendicularly to the orange line, this point has some value over here on this, this T, a T1 value over here. It has a T2 value somewhere along there. Where those T1 T2 values intersect is where that point projects onto the plane. Okay? So you'll sometimes see these, these methods like PCA, so called projection methods. They're called projection methods because of this phenomenon that each observation is can be projected onto this plane. And we what we if you think about how we calculated this plane, we calculated this plane so that it best fits the data. So this plane is actually a good approximation of the data. So we've, we've calculated a 2D plane that approximates this, three this data set in three dimensions. Okay, so I'm just going to work through a bit of the mathematics um, on that. Um, but here, let me just start by saying that if we look at what we've done, we've taken our x variable, our x space, and we've, we've divided it into two parts. We've We've divided it into a, a, the projection onto the plane as well as the residual distance off the plane. So if we look at it back here, each data point we can say consists of its projection onto the plane as well as that residual height off the plane. Gives us some idea of how that data point uh, lies. So let me just work through a bit of the mathematics of projection. I think this is really important because I could just go and show you the linear algebra representation of PCA, but I want you to see where it's coming from. So we'll work through a bit of the math uh, that's on page 15 of the notes. So it looks a little bit complex or it's not too, too hard, but let's just uh, derive a bit of what's going on here. Okay, so 
the diagram that I had up earlier with the first component and the second component, I'm just going to draw the first component. So, so let's say that's, that's the first component, and I'll call this P1. Um, you'll see later on why, why we call it that. Um, and this is my origin over here. So, so this would be X3, X2, and X1. Okay, so this is my origin over here, and this first component, P1, kind of went off in that direction. Okay? And let's take an observation that happened to be up here. So this observation over here, there's several others around it that I'm not going to draw, but what we did was we projected this point at 90 degrees onto that P1 direction. Okay. So if this point is up here, so we can draw a vector, and we'll call this vector Xi, so this is the i theta point in our data set. So vector Xi goes from the origin of the coordinate system out to where the point actually is. P1 is also a vector, it's a vector that points in that direction of the first component. So we're in k-dimensional space, or three-dimensional space. If I had to write p out, it would be a k by one vector. In other words, p11, p21, p31. Okay? That's what p1, p1 is. x1 is also just a three-dimensional vector. It's, uh, or xi rather, so x1i, um, x2i, okay, so this is, I mean, let, me look, let me rather write this way, x is really just, a, it's a row from that original x matrix, so if this was matrix x, we'll just take the i-th row, okay, and we'll call this x, one i, x two i, three i. Put a little transpose there so the numbers make sense. But what we're doing is we're just taking this this vector out of the matrix X, and that's its location in that three D data store. So that, there's nothing new here, right? I'm just showing you that point is just a, a vector from matrix X, and P one is the vector that, that points in a direction that best explains all the data. Now, geometrically, this, when we project this down at 90 degrees, we form an angle here called theta. And you may recall then that the cosine of theta is equal to this length over here, or the Two arrows, so that length, the adjacent length, is equal to the adjacent length, divided by the hypotenuse. And writing that another way, this would be T i uh, 1. So this, I'm calling this T i because this is the distance for this point x i from the origin. So Ti was that distance. So that's my adjacent length, is Ti. And the, the length on the hypotenuse is given by, I'll just explain some notation in case you're unfamiliar with it. When I write something like this, Xi, it says that's the, the length of Xi. Um, are you familiar with this notation? No? For some of you are. Okay, so let me just quickly recap for those that haven't seen it. When you put these things on either side of x, you're saying take the norm of x, or Caltech, give me the length of x, which in terms of the raw data would mean take x1i squared plus x2i squared plus x3i squared, take the sum of squares and take the square root. Okay? 
which is nothing more than the distance. So we recall from high school math, that would be the distance of a vector. So when we say adjacent divided by hypotenuse, this is the adjacent length. The hypotenuse length is this. The length of that is just given by xi. Like that. Okay, so that's the adjacent length divided by the hypotenuse is equal to the cosine of the okay. Now, that same cosine of theta is also equal to the dot product. In fact, that's how we define the dot product in, in, in math. You, uh, I can call that the cosine of theta between um, two vectors is equal to the dot product between them, in this case it's xi transpose times p1, so it's the dot product between those two vectors divided by the length of the two vectors separately. So divided by xi divided by p1. So that's the definition of the dot product. So if we equate those two, that's equal to ti1 divided by which simplifies to, um, I'm just going to switch this around, ti1 <coughs> is equal to xi transpose times p1. The reason why it simplifies out is because we define these direction vectors, p1, p2, p3, those direction vectors, we define them to be unit length. Okay. So that's just by, by, by convention, we'll define that to unit length. So this is equal to 1. Those two cancel out, and we're left with this. That's what we had earlier on when we were looking at the temperature and the board thickness example, right? We said that it's a linear combination of the x's given by the weights in P. So remember, when we were looking at the temperature in this room, we said the average temperature, we call it T1, was equal to X1, the first thermometer, times its weight, P11, plus the second temperature, times its weight, P21, plus the third temperature, P31. Okay, so that's where that comes from. It fits in naturally with that intuitive thinking that we have. So if you had to go do a PCA on that temperature data, you would expect the first component really just to show you this is the average temperature, right? Like we did. And you would expect these weights, PI of P11, P21, P31, P41, to all be roughly the same number to give you a, a linear combination of the x's that gives you an average temperature. Okay, so this is exactly what we had before except we've just derived it looking at geometric principles and, and maybe you had to use a bit of trigonometry and, and algebra and so on from the previous courses to get to it. But the main point is that we can say the T value is easily calculated. We take the X value for the data point and we just multiply it by the unit vector P so once we found, we still haven't come, come to how we find this vector. I know that's probably bugging you. How do we find this vector that best fits the data? Well, assume that we found it, and with P1, we can create a unit vector from it. And once we have that, we can just say, take my vector xi, multiply it by that P, and we'll get the score value, this distance from the origin to where that x is projected onto the line. Okay. Now, we can do that for the whole matrix. So, we could also say then, so let me just rewrite that equation. So, xi transpose times p1. So, this was a vector, a 1 by k vector times a k by 1 vector. So xi 
transpose was just we just extract this vector from x. P1 is a k by 1 vector. So this is equal to a 1 by 1 scalar, as we expect. Ti is just, it, it's just a number, it's a distance, it's not a vector. Okay. Now we can go do this for the next x in the, for the matrix. So, so if this is the i throw over here, we can go do it for the next row, the next row, the next row, the next row, and so on. Or we can just write capital X, which is now the n by k matrix, multiplied by P1, which is a k by 1 vector. Okay? And we just get our T1 vector this time. So previously we had Ti1 to indicate it was the ith observation. But if we do it for the whole matrix, multiplied by the same vector, the vector doesn't change. So this is still a vector times a vector. Here's just a scalar. Here we say a matrix times this vector gives us an n by 1 vector. We can easily calculate the t vector in one go in a, in a convenient matrix algebra. Okay. Now, there's probably just a few more minutes for me to go through one other point here, and that's what happens, what's about the second component? So the second component is calculated no different. So the second component has to be orthogonal to this first one. So let's draw this line. It's 90 degrees. Okay, so this would be P2. And this angle, so let's first then take this. This is our, our point X. We project it down perpendicularly to the P2 direction vector. So now, I'll call this angle phi, and what did you say that is? The cosine of that angle is equal to the adjacent length. So this is now our, our, our 90 degree triangle is this over here. Okay. So the adjacent length is this distance, which happens to be T2, and the Ti2. So it's the t, va t value in the second component for the ith observation. So adjacent divided by hypotenuse. Hypotenuse is still xi. And the adjacent length is ti2. Okay. But cosine of that angle happens to be the dark product between the two vectors in which it lies. So that's xi transpose times P2 this time, divided through by the size of the vectors. Okay. And as before, when we equate these, P2 is also a unit vector. The xi distances cancel out. So we're going to Ti2 is equal to xi transpose times P2. So exactly the same form as before. So the second component scores are found exactly the same way. We, we, we use the x as is, as the same x that we used over here. And instead of multiplying by p1, we multiply by p2. You'd expect then that if we do this is the second purely matrix form, we would get something like uh, t2, the matrix, uh, sorry, the vector would be equal to the whole matrix x, which is n by k times P2 vector K by 1 is equal to an N by 1 vector. Okay. So it's no different for the second component than the first component. And then we can take that a step further and do this all in one go by doing something like T1 vector, T2 vector up to, I'll use this generic symbol A, we're going to calculate A of these vectors, so group them together, so that's an n by 1, an n by 1, an n by 1, this whole thing is equal to n by A, we will call that capital T, okay, and that's going to be equal to capital X, which is an n by K matrix, times um, just to say 
hard to work with the math to get you to understand it. But what we're saying is we can get to this reduced dimensional space. Remember T is an n by a vector, a matrix. By multiplying our raw data by this k by a matrix that you're wondering how to calculate. So just multiply our raw data an n by k matrix by this k by a matrix, and then we can get to this reduced dimensional space T. So P, P is really what's going to take us from our real world measurements, these K measurements that we have, the matrix P is going to transform us to a new coordinate system given by these T's. Um, so there's a lot, a lot to take in here. I can see a few confused faces. So I'm going to resume the next class with a bit of these concepts. I probably will we'll skip over the math in the second class. But the, what I want you to take on from this is that we're going to move from a much larger dimensional space to a smaller dimensional space, T. That's, that's the key point. And what I'll put up on the website is a tutorial for you to work through um, some of this with a, with a case study. That would, um, and you can kind of see step by step where this is going and what the advantages are. The next the class, we'll work through an example of one. Okay, so thanks for your attention.